Hello and welcome to this webinar on scent imprinting. My name is Jans Frank and I'm an associate professor at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences and also work at the Scandinavian Working Dog Institute where we train dogs and dog handlers. This is a recording of the webinar I did two days ago because it was not recorded then and several people have asked for the recording. So now, now I'm trying to <laughs> repeat the same presentation and recording it and posting it to you who attended the webinar. So hopefully you will recognize yourself, although some details I'm sure will be slightly different. Scent imprinting can be made extremely complicated and that is not my intention tonight at least. So tonight I want to approach scent imprinting from a very practical point of view and we will focus on the practical procedures for how to teach dogs a new scent. And before starting that I would just like to put the scent imprinting in a broader context. So there are dog trainers around the world who start very early in the training process of a new dog with the scent imprinting and they reach very good results for working dogs. We typically add the scent imprinting in the final stages of a green dogs training and reach fairly good results with that as well. And it is that approach that I'll explain to you here tonight. So just be aware that this is not the only way of doing it, but this is one way of doing it that works. But there are other ways that also work. So typically we train the dog to indicate and search for a useless scent like pieces of comb or other dog toys or something else. And the reasons for that are several. One is that then we can do the initial training and learning of how to indicate, how to search systematically and get the frustration that is associated with learning a new thing, associated with the non-target scent. And then when everything works the way we want it to, we can add the target scent. Another reason is because when the target scent is explosives or parts of animals, it's rather messy to store and transport these scent samples. So if we only have that option, it will mean that we restrict the training to certain contexts. It is something of a procedure to bring explosives into an airport or airplane or a subway station to do training, which means dogs generally get to search and make very few finds in that context, which of course expect, uh, affects their expectation to find targets there. So by using a useless and also harmless target scent as cone pieces, for example, it's a lot of maintenance training that can be done with that way, keeping the dog's expectation to find very high. So typically, when a dog can indicate the way we want and search systematically the way we want, that's when we start to add the real target scents. And I'll just show you a video clip of what the dog's skills typically are when we add the target scents. Thank <laughs> you. 
So the dog can indicate the way we want it and it can search with a high expectation to find the target scent from the beginning of the search. One way of complicating scent imprinting is to dive into the physiological parts of this. So dissecting the dog's nose and olfactory system. Here, I would not do that. But we have to approach the concept of sense a little bit. So if we, for example, view these circles as scents. And in this case, it is the different scents emitted by large carnivores, such as bears, wolves, wolverines, lynx. So the bigger the circle, the stronger or more salient is the scent to the dog. The smaller the circle, the less strong, significant or salient is the scent to the dog. If we then just try to illustrate how these scents are distributed over the large carnivore species, it may look something like this. Many scents will of course be uh, the same. Many of these animals feed on the same food items. They live in the same environment. They have blood, muscles, uh, claws, uh, fur. Many things are the same and will smell approximately the same. And the problem here is that the concept of a species it's not a biological entity, it's a human-made entity, something that we have made up to try to organize nature a bit to ourselves. So it's very hard to communicate the concept of species to a dog. What we can do is to train the dog to search for a scent picture. So a mix of scents that represents what the dog should be looking for. And by keeping this scent picture to the variation within the group of animals that we call brown bears, we may over time make the dog very specific in which scats, for example, the dog alerts on. This is a rather time consuming concept because not only is there a large overlap when it comes to bear scats and how they smell with other species like dogs, wolves, lynx, wolverines and badgers but there is also a large variation within the group of animals that we call brown bear. So now <laughs> we'll have a kind of an orgy in pictures of brown bear scats. So a brown bear scat where the bear has typically been feeding on blueberries and lingonberries in the autumn, like they do here in Scandinavia looks like this. In the spring, when the bears leave the den, the typical scat looks like this. The bear has not been pooping for the entire winter, so it's a rather hard, compressed, massive scat. When the bear has been feeding mainly on meat from a carcass, the scat looks like this, but you can also see that there are some berries in it, but very few. A scat with 
mainly meat, but a higher proportion of berries looks something like this. Scats where the carcass begins to come to an end and the bear feeds mainly on hair and a lot on uh, pieces of bone, turns gradually whiter and whiter. And in the end of a carcass, the scat looks like this, because then the bear is consuming almost only bones. If the bear has been scared, the scat looks like this. And so on. The variation is very big, also within species of our interest. That means we need to have a large variation in our scent samples in order to be able to communicate to the dog that we are interested in scats from this group of animals. And I have uh, seen studies where they claim that the dogs has learned to generalize species after only uh, having been exposed to fewer than 10 different scent samples from fewer than 10 different individuals of that species. And in my experience, that is uh, not realistic. It's only realistic if we make an unrealistic test where we don't expose the dog to other species or scats that are very similar to the target scats that we are searching for. My experience is that this communicating to the dog that it's searching for scats that are within this scent picture and it should ignore scats that have the scent picture of a dog scat or a wolf or a lynx or a wolverine scat that requires several hundreds of scent samples from different individuals in order to be reliable. So you can produce results on the, in the lab that make it look like the dog can actually discriminate between the species. But once again, in my experience, when we then expose the dog to the cruel reality out there where there are many other species living in the same habitat, feeding on the same food items, it uh, is hard for the dog to learn exactly what kind of scent picture it is we want it to alert on. I have tried to structure this webinar around these four steps of imprinting. So first, we have to choose a procedure for how to do scent imprinting. So that means we need to teach the dog a procedure where we can continuously, throughout the whole dog's life, do scent imprinting. Because if we, for example, imprint a dog on explosives here in Sweden, and then send the dog to search for explosives in Afghanistan or Mali, it is not likely that the dog will be very accurate or reliable in that new environment. Not because the dog is uh, poorly trained or anything like that, but because the explosives produced locally there smell completely different compared to the scent picture produced by explosives. Although it may be the same explosives as we label them, they are manufactured in different factories, they are stored in different 
containers in different temperatures and for different <clears throat> amounts of time. And that means their scent picture is completely different compared to the scent picture of the explosives that we find here in Sweden. So we need to have a procedure for imprinting so that we can continuously imprint the dog on new material that is found where the dog is supposed to work. And to be honest, this is probably the bottleneck for most detection dog uh, authorities or organization. So in our job, we regularly meet police dog handlers or military working dog handlers that uh, train with the same scent samples for six months or even more than a year in a row. And then the dog becomes very good at finding pieces from that batch or that container of explosives. But that's not very useful since you have that batch or you have that container of explosives in your hand. So the dog will never be exposed to that explosive again. And in order for the dog to be able to generalize, it needs to ex be exposed to many different scent samples that has been stored and produced in different ways. There just is no way around that. And in order to do that, we need an imprinting procedure that we can bring with us out in the field. What that procedure looks like is not important. It can be a scent wheel, it can be a brick wall, it can be a lineup of bricks or other containers. But it's important that we teach the dog that in this procedure, in this context, I want you to pay attention to new scents. Because in other working contexts, that's the opposite of what we want. Then we want it to ignore new scents and only alert on the ones that we have imprinted. When we have chosen the procedure, then we train the dog to work in that procedure. And that's very easy if you have a dog that's trained to alert on cone pieces or other scents, because then you can use them to create a high expectation to find scents in the scent wheel or brick wall. And after that, we teach the dog target scents on the scent wheel. And for each new target scent we add, this is easier and easier because the dog starts to understand the concept that it's supposed to alert to and pay attention to new scents in this very specific context. And when it works on the scent wheel or whatever procedure you use, you rapidly move the training out to different contexts, not to create any expectations here that will make work harder for you. So my plan is that we'll go through these four steps one at a time. And I want to show you some examples of procedures. And when choosing a procedure, please bear in mind that you should be able to bring this procedure with you into field conditions when you're deployed, for example, in another uh, country. Because then you will have access, hopefully, to new scent samples that will be hard to get access to when you're at your home base. I'll show a video clip of some different scent imprinting procedures. So one way of doing it is to have a brick wall and then it's good to have a smaller brick wall uh, between one and maximum two square meters because if the brick wall is larger it just takes longer time for the dog to encounter the new 
targets and, and there is no reason for that. The advantage of the scent wheel is that it's without a beginning and an end, so we don't risk creating or being handicapped by the dog's expectations to find in the start or in the end or in the middle. So that makes it very, uh, very useful. However, you need a place to put it up and you need to be able to transport it. A small uh, lineup like this can be very useful. It doesn't take much space, but it has a beginning and an end. Hello. Making a lineup like this out of bricks is useful because you can find bricks in most places you come to or other containers and it's easy to dispose of them so you don't have to make a lot of cleaning in between training sessions you can just get new bricks that are not contaminated with your target scents <laughs> Yes, good. Yeah, Drama. And of course, scent wheels doesn't have to be very expensive. They can be built like in the video clip you saw by using a simple cardboard box and uh, paper coffee cups so it's maybe a total cost of uh, well three dollars to build one like this and then it's also easy to just use them for one training session and build a completely new one the next training session and uh, get rid of the risk for contaminating the structure with scents So each of these procedures has its pros and cons. Just choose one that fits your uh, way of working. When you've done that, we want the dog to have the same expectation to find the target scent on all positions of the scent wheel or the brick wall or the lineup. And that needs to be trained. So what we do then is that we, if we use the example of a scent wheel, we teach the dog to search all arms on the carousel or on the scent wheel for Kong or another scent that the dog has an expectation on. And when the dog can do a blind search for Kong or for the target scent three times in a row on the carousel. Then we move on to imprinting the actual target scent. And the easiest way many times to have the dog have the same expectation to find the target scent on all locations is to, if we use the carousels or the scent wheels, add one arm of the scent wheel at the time. And typically what I do is that I try to overemphasize the first arm. Because what other what otherwise often happens is that the dog gets a higher expectation to find the target scent further ahead in the scent wheel. And I want it to start sniffing from the first arm. So I typically 
overemphasize that by placing the target scent much more often in the first arm than in the others. So here is an example when I, where I train a dog to start to search the scent wheel and start with one arm, then two arms, three arms, and so on. So I think you get the concept and then we add gradually more and more arms until we have all the 12 arms and the dog has the same expectation to find targets and in all of them. So at this point we make a test an ordinary uh, blind test just to see if the dog and handler can actually find the arm with the target scent that is in this case is a piece of Kong or another target scent that the dog already knows and I find it very useful to use randomizers like the pretty random app or other randomizing apps that you can have in your phone. There are many other ways, ways of randomizing, but the apps on the phones are uh, really neat. Because you as humans are not very uh, good at being random. We are very predictable and habits of creature of habits. So it's easier if you have an assistant that randomizes which arm, in this case between 1 and 12, that the target scent should be in, and you as a handler have no ID. And then you have to decide if you should reward or not reward when the dog indicates. You can, as a sub-goal towards this, make a half-blind search where you send the dog to search the scent wheel and when the dog indicates you make eye contact with the assistant and he or she shows you whether the dog is making a correct indication or an incorrect indication and that would be a half blind search and that can be a sub goal but before you move on to imprinting target scent my recommendation would be that you can make a blind search where you take the decision to reward or not to reward yourself because if you cannot do that that means there is still a certain degree of insecurity in whether the dog can actually find the target scent in the scent wheel or not and then it's better to train on that before starting to imprint a new target scent so this uh, test may look like this for example
So, please use randomizers. Then it's time to teach the new scent. And the goal is that the dog can search for the target scent with the same expectation to find target scent on all positions in the scent wheel or brick wall or whatever procedure you use. And we typically do this in this manner. So first we train the dog to indicate on the new target scent. Let's say it's bear hairs, hairs from hair from bears that the dog should indicate. Then I would have 11 empty arms or empty containers in the scent wheel and one containing the target scent. If I then send the dog to search the scent wheel, it will search for Kong, which is the target scent it has been taught from before. So the first time it encounters the bear hair, it will not react because it's searching for Kong. But after taking some laps on the scent wheel, it will start to sniff more intensely to see uh, where the target scent may be hiding. And then when the dog is sniffing more intense in the canister that contains the bear hair, I can reward that. And then slowly or gradually, it doesn't take very long time, increase the dog's expectation on that new scent. Another way of doing it is to do pairing. So then instead of having just a tube with the bear hair or the target scent, we would have a tube or something containing the target scent. In this case, it's bear hair. Mm -hmm. And in the same arm or in the same canister, we would have a piece of comb. When the dog has indicated that once, I would cut the cone piece in halves and use half the cone piece, then cut that one into halves and that one into halves. And then after five or six repetitions, we would be down to so small cone pieces, you cannot really handle them anymore. And then it would be time to have the dog learning to indicate just the bare hair. And both of these procedures work very well, whether you build it on the contrasting where the dog learns to indicate something compared to nothing, or where the dog learns to gradually pair the new scent with the old target scent. Both of them work. Personally, I prefer the contrasting method, just because it is a little bit quicker because however you do the pairing there will come a time hopefully sooner than later where you need to remove the cone pieces from the scent picture and then you are basically at the first step of the contrasting so in my experience i only lose some time if i do the pairing so I generally don't use that method, but it works very well if you, uh, if you want to go that way. The procedure or the order in which we do it is exactly the same, whether we do the contrasting or the pairing. So first we have the dog. The goal is for the dog to indicate only target scent in the scent wheel and have all other arms empty, so no sense. 
Then the next goal is to have the dog do a blind search for target scent, all other arms empty. Then we add low value distracting scents and low value distracting scents may be things like rocks, sticks, uh, plastic pieces, uh, coins, whatever. And when the dog can make a blind search and indicate three times in a row the new target scent with low value distracting scents, we add high value distracting scents. And that may be things like dog treats, pieces of other dog toys, uh, rope from dog toys, pieces of uh, bite equipment like bite suits or sleeves. And when that works, we make blind search with the target scent and similar scents. And this is the really frustrating part. It's fairly easy and quick to train the dog to ignore the distracting scents of low value and high value. However, to teach the dog to ignore similar scents, that's where we have to communicate this concept of species for example if we want the dog to search for only bear hair or bear scats we can make it easy for us so instead of putting if we want the dog to search and indicate bear scats so then instead of putting scats from foxes or dogs or wolves or badgers that live in the same area we can put scats in the other containers from completely different animals like birds and otters and voles in the other uh, arms. But that's not what the dog will face as an issue when it's starting to do the search in real scenarios. If we then want the dog to discriminate and indicate only bear scats and ignore scats from foxes, lynx, wolves, badgers from the same area, then we need to train that. And that is the most time consuming piece of this training. And it's the same for explosives, for example. What we think of as RDX that's a label to us but to the dog rdx is not one scent it's probably several hundred different scents depending on how the rdx has been um, produced because there may be slightly different proportions of the ingredients when producing these explosives and the explosives are produced in different temperatures in different factories in different containers so just like people can tell the difference between wine from different districts or even different years or whether they have been stored in different kinds of um, cellars or uh, bottles and so on it's the same for dogs, where these explosives have been produced or stored and for how long will have an impact on their scent picture. So if we want the dog to work, work reliably, we have to have a large sample of the actual scent picture that we want the dog to alert on. And we need to train the dog to actively ignore similar scents. And this requires some uh, thinking as well. So, for example, if you're searching for homemade explosives, the ingredients are often easy to find. And let's say, for example, that one ingredient in a homemade explosive is diesel, ordinary diesel oil that you put in the cars. So if we train the dog to alert on diesel, which is one of the ingredients, we may run into problems because diesel is also present 
uh, even if there are no terrorists having placed it there. So we will get the dog alerting on a lot of places without there being any homemade explosives. On the other hand, if we train the dog to actively ignore diesel, the dog may uh, miss some homemade explosives where the most salient scent coming out from them is the diesel scent. And the best way of avoiding this is to present the dog with as many scent samples of the variation of the scent picture we want them to alert on. And the same goes for the similar scents that we want them not to alert on. And there needs to be some amounts of thinking going into that decision, what the dogs should and should not alert on. And then even more training to communicate these thinkings to the dog. So, with the risk of repeating myself, I just want to highlight these two things that will, to a large extent, determine if the dog gets a chance to learn to find the target scent. One is your ability to collect a lot of scent samples. So here it's, for example, bear hair from different individuals and as i spoke of earlier with bear scats there is a large variation within the species so different individuals smell different old males smell different than young males uh, and males smell different than females and to complicate it even more they will smell different depending on what they have been eating and in which terrain they live. And to complicate it even more, a piece of hair from the, what you call this, the cheek of the bear smells completely different compared to a piece of hair from its belly or its tail or from its hind foot. So there is a large variation here to take into account and the more scent samples you can imprint your dog on, the higher is the likelihood that the dog understands that it is this variation of scent pictures that we're looking for, not the ones that are out here or and uh, not only the small part in here, but the whole scent picture that is uh, left by hairs from the group of animals that we call bears. Not only young female bears or old male bears, but bears. The second thing is that you need some discipline. So when using, for example, a scent wheel for the imprinting, you need to make sure that the only thing that is different in the container containing the target scent from the other 11 ones in a 12 arm scent wheel is the target scent. So that means you can absolutely not touch these tubes with your hands and neither should any other person that trains with you or lives with you or any colleague to you because that risks being a systematic error in the scent picture that you train your dog to alert on. So what may happen then is that the dog learns to alert on the scent picture of brown bear hair and the smell of a, a person, the same person or the same group of persons every time. So the dog will not make a false alert and alert on wolf or lynx or wolverine hair, but it will not 
alert on their hair that misses the scent of this significant person. If you're searching for explosives or drugs, it's generally not a problem that the scent samples that you search are contaminated with human scent, as long as it's not the same humans or the same groups of humans every time. And especially it should not be your scent or the scent of other significant persons like your colleagues or family members. But if it's different people every time, it's less of a problem because drugs and explosives almost always has uh, been touched by at least one person. When the dog can do the indication on the target scent in a scent wheel with all other canisters empty, we make a test where we make a blind search for the target scent, uh, all other canisters empty. And if we dwell here for a while, so when I first let the dog go to search the scent wheel for a new target scent that the dog has no expectation on, of course, we don't expect the dog to make any alert. So what we do then is that we reward the dog just for sniffing. So when the dog is searching and it comes to the box or canister that contains the new target scent, as I said before, it will be searching for the old target scent that has been learned before. So the first laps, it will just ignore the new target scent. It's just a distractant to it. But after two or three laps, it will start to sniff more intense. And then we reward the dog for just sniffing the correct box. And often it's enough to reward that once or twice. Of course, we change the place of the target scent after each uh, reward because what otherwise happens if I only spin the arms so that the dog has now been indicating this canister and I just spin the wheel so this canister is pointing in another direction then we lose control over what we're rewarding the dog for indicating on because there is a high likelihood that in this canister that the dog has just been indicating on, there is some dog slobber or some specific scent that is typical for that box. So in order to be in control of that, we randomize which arm the target scent should be in the next repetition. And we take out the small glass tube that contains the target scent and move it to the new canister. If it's a very heavy scent that is collected in gas form in the bottom of the canister, we can take a piece of paper, for example, and just uh, wave above it to ventilate the scent out of the canister. This is rarely a problem. If the dog goes back to the same canister indicating it is nine times out of ten not because of any residual scent but either because of memory or because there is the scent of dog slobber or uh, treats there. When we have rewarded the sniffing of the correct box then I will reward the reaction to the correct box. When you see that the dog is reacting to the box with the target scent in a way that it doesn't react to the others. And usually it's enough doing that three, four times. And then we can reward the dog for going into an indication because after rewarding the sniffing of the correct box, the reaction to the correct box, if we just wait with rewarding, the dog will most likely go into a full indication and then we can reward that. We can have a look at the video clip of what it may look like 
when I, for example, imprinted a new scent on this dog. And here the scent is uh, RDX, the explosive that I'm imprinting this dog. So. So. so here I just rewarded the dog for sniffing the correct box. You could see the dog didn't really understand why it was reinforced. But after some repetitions, the dog begin to see a pattern. So here there is a slight reaction, at least, to the target scent. You can see that the dog is reacting a bit. So first we reinforce sniffing the correct box without the dog knowing why it got rewarded but after some repetitions it starts to see the pattern. Then we reinforce when the dog reacts to the correct box and then we wait for the dog to actually start going into an indication and after some repetitions that indication becomes more and more firm and the dog is more and more uh, aware of what it is being reinforced for doing. When you do this there will be false alerts because the dog to start with is just experiencing that you're rewarding it and it doesn't really understand why. So the dog may think it has been rewarded for touching the canister or because one of the canisters, the one that you happen to click the dog on, smells more of something than the others and it's not your target scent. Or uh, something else. And it will take some repetitions before the dog sees the same pattern at you as you do. And that's also one of the reasons why you need to move the target scent between the arms here to make sure that the least common denominator every time the dog is reinforced is the new target scent. When, because it's not if, but when the dog makes a false alert, I suggest you just ignore it 
and wait for the dog to start searching again. Because at this stage, the dog is not very sure what it's supposed to indicate. So usually it doesn't take many seconds before the dog is a bit insecure and then continues searching. And you have the chance uh, to reward the dog for indicating the correct arm. If you make a reset here, you risk creating other patterns. You can add that later as a form of punishment, because if the dog is highly motivated with your reward, your let's say you reward with a ball, and the dog is totally crazy for the reward, then making a false alert and not being rewarded is quite a harsh punishment. And it's something the dog will try to stay away from because it wants its reward as quick as possible. But if the dog is medium uh, motivated by your reward, then it may not be a very harsh punishment for the dog just sitting down hoping to be rewarded and not being rewarded so then there is no cost for making these false alerts and then the dog just goes sits goes to the next sit goes to the next sit and if there is no cost cost associated with that and sooner or later the dog will sit by the right arm and it will get rewarded then that will never become better by itself. So then you have to introduce a cost for making a false alert. And one such cost can be that you call the dog back to you, place it in a sit and let it wait for a while. So it becomes a little bit boring. I don't suggest that you introduce uh, more harsh punishment here at this stage because the dog has no idea what you want it to do. So by punishing the dog by sounding angry may not make this procedure easier because then the dog will be even more uncertain and you will get even more false alerts and you will get, get even more annoyed and that's a spiral going the wrong way. So try first to ignore the false alerts and if they continue, just make resets. And we can have a look at the video where this dog is making a false alert and how I suggest you handle it. So prepare for false alerts because they will come. And it's easier to manage them if you have prepared mentally for them. One thing that often happens with this kind of containers that we have in this scent wheel is a mesh lid or a metal lid with holes in it. Even dogs that don't lick generally when searching in other contexts have a tendency to start licking these lids. And especially if you train several dogs on the same scent wheel after each other, 
when one starts to lick, there becomes uh, a lot of yummy things, and then the others also will start to press their nose against it and lick the lid. This rarely creates any issues in other contexts. Uh, my experience is that they, they don't transfer this licking to other contexts. But if you don't want the dogs to lick in this context, you can of course train it. Uh, but then you need to train it on an other target scent that the dog already knows, like a Kong piece. Don't train it and teach a new target scent at the same time. That's, that's a recipe for a disaster. There are also other ways of doing this. So you can have canisters with another lid. So for example, this is another type of uh, canisters where you can see it's just a metal arm covering each canister to keep it in place and to prevent that the dog sticks its nose down into the can. Because if there are explosives or drugs or other dangerous material there, it may uh, very well harm or kill the dog or it may contaminate your scent samples and you don't want that. And if you have this kind of metal arm just over the container, it rarely produces the licking that the mesh or the metal can lids with holes in it does. When the dog can do a blind search for the target scent with all the other arms empty, it's time to start adding the distracting scents. And first we add low value distracting scents and then high value distracting scents. And we'll just have an example, uh, have a look at the video here showing an example where a dog is being imprinted on the explosive Semtex. Uh, in the number two of these arms, and the other arms are other scents of low to maybe medium value to this specific dog. Sorry. Also here, we of course use the randomizer not to create any patterns, uh, undeliberately that we later need to handle.
And it's the same here. We differentiate between a half blind search where the dog is searching and when it indicates you look for the assistant to give you a sign, that's a half blind search. And before moving on, you need to be able to do a, a normal blind search where you as a handler takes the decision whether the dog indicated correctly or not without asking the assistant. And when the dog can do this with high value distracting scents, you do the same thing, but with similar scents. And as I said, this is a step that takes a lot of time. And it also requires a lot of work before doing the imprinting, because you need to find similar scents and collect a lot of scent samples from them as well. So if we need the dog to search for and alert only on wolf scats, then we need to find a lot of fox scats and bear scats and badger scats and lynx scats and dog scats that has been eating the same food as the wolves in the same area. And to give an example of this concept of species, so dogs and wolves are the same species biologically. However, when we train dogs to discriminate wolf scats from other scats, it has never been a problem to train them to differentiate between other wolf uh, between other dog scats and wolf scats although it's the same species wolves and dogs simply because they eat totally different things and live totally different lives so their scats don't even smell remotely the same what has been a problem is fox scats red fox scats because they to a large degree follow wolves and feed from the same carcasses during the same times of the year as wolves does. And that means the only difference is that the meat has been passing through a red fox stomach uh, and digestive system compared to the stomach and digestive system of a wolf. And that scent picture is uh, not easy to communicate the difference between two a dog. So we're not teaching the dog the concept of species, because then the dog would alert on dog scats just as well as wolf scats, since they are the same species. Uh, but we're teaching the dog to find a similar scent picture, and then we need a lot of similar scents that we don't want the dog to pay attention to and indicate. So when we have done this on the scent wheel or lineup or whatever procedure we use for the scent imprinting, then it's time to move on to train with the target scent in different contexts. Okay. Because if I spend weeks training the dog to find Semtex on the scent wheel, it becomes very good at that. But since dogs are highly context dependent, the dog doesn't necessarily become good at finding Semtex in airports or in houses or in people's bags, just because it's good to find it in a scent wheel. So the goal is, of course, that the dog can search for and indicate the target scent in other relevant contexts. And the way I typically do that is that when the dog can do discrimination and identify and indicate the target scent among similar scents on the scent wheel, 
in a blind search three times in a row. I moved to the brick wall. And for those of you who has been on our webinar on systematic search, you know we follow this procedure where the dog is first searching a brick wall, then lineups, then walls, vehicles, indoor and outdoor areas. And then we just redo exactly the same steps because the dog has already been doing this with the useless scent like cone pieces. So the dog has an expectation to find target scent in these uh, contexts, not just the new target scent. So then we first start with the brick walls and that is where we introduce the blank searches. So on the scent wheel, the dog has not had to do any blank searches because there we want the dog to have a high expectation to indicate on new target scents. So doing blank searches on that procedure that we use to train a new scent, that would be counterproductive. But here in the first new context that we bring the tar new target scent in, we really need to start doing blank searches because most of the dog's operational time will be spent doing blank searches. And for how long the dog should be doing blank searches, of course, depends. But as a rule of thumb, we allow our uh, dog teams that pass through our programs here to start with either one or two minute blank searches. And just to make you hopefully remember how important this step is, I will force you to watch a two minute blank search of this dog, which is not very exciting, but it is a crucial step in order to avoid false alerts later on. Not very exciting, huh? So please remember that I wasted two minutes of your life watching a dog doing a blank search because it is 
extremely important that you add this to your training when you start bringing the target scent from your uh, imprinting procedure like the scent wheel or a lineup to the first new context and then you just continue throughout the other contexts in the same manner as you did when you train the dog to search systematically. So you bring the new target scent first into brick walls, then vehicles, uh, indoor, outdoor areas and lineups, of course. And then, of course, it's important to remember to stick to the same criteria when it comes to how the dog should search and how the dog should indicate. And by doing this procedure repeatedly with new target scents, your dog will get better and better at understanding this procedure and it will be quicker and quicker. So that was it for this recording of the Scent Imprint imprinting webinar. So there will not be any questions now because I am the only participant in this webinar, unfortunately. So I hope you enjoyed the webinar and I wish you a very good night. Thank you.